gold was selling off. Well, same thing happened again as soon as this number came out and it wasn't worse than expected or maybe even a little bit cooler than expected. Gold immediately rallied and ended up closing about on the high of the day, up around $24. Still, gold is still at about $17.52 following a sell-off that I talked about last week and also early this week, which I'll get into a bit later in the podcast. But for now, I just want to focus on the fact that gold rallied when inflation was not worse than expected and sold off when it was worse than expected. They believe the Fed and they're not worried about inflation, even though it's here. What they're worried about is the Fed having to fight inflation. In fact, they're confident that the Fed is going to fight inflation. They believe that they will battle inflation by tapering their asset purchases and eventually ending the asset purchases altogether and by normalizing interest rates, raising rates from zero. And so since the Fed is going to fight inflation, investors don't want to fight the Fed. That is an age-old Wall Street adage, don't fight the Fed. And if the Fed is going to be fighting inflation, well, you don't want to own gold because in that environment where you have the Fed tightening policy, everybody believes that that environment is bad for gold. You know, in fact, if you look at the CPI numbers that came out, if you just focus in on what's happened in 2021, year to date, so far, The CPI is up 4.2% in the first seven months of the year. So the Fed said that they were going to shoot for inflation that was slightly above 2%. Well, we're already at 4.2%. That's not slightly above 2%. That's more than double 2%. I mean, the Fed never really defined what it meant by an inflation that is slightly above 2%. I mean, what is that, 2.1, 2.2? I mean, yeah, that would be slightly above 2%. 2.5%, would that be slightly above? I don't know. I mean, 25 is closer to 3 That really sparked a uh, panic. Well, we left 4% in the dust uh, where we are now. As I said, we're already beyond 4% just in the first seven months of the year. But if we were using the 1970s CPI, the annualized rate, I think, would already be well north of 10%. I think it would be probably higher than any individual year during that entire decade or the early part of the 1980s. One of the reasons is the use of owner's equivalent rent instead of actual rent, right? The government is claiming that Rents are barely rising. It's a third of the CPI. Of course, there are other housing expenses that are part of the CPI too that are understated. But rents is a third and they're using owner's equivalent rent. So everybody who's saying we have nothing to worry about because it's not as bad as the 1970s, it actually may already be worse than the 1970s. And the bigger problem is we're early on. This is just getting started. So when you compare the inflation rate that we're getting now at the beginning of the cycle to the inflation rates we got back in the 70s at the end of the cycle, you can only imagine how much worse it's going to get when this cycle eventually tops out. Now, in the meantime, not a lot of coverage is being given to the Fed's changing of the meaning of transitory. You know, I talked about it on the podcast, but I don't really hear many other people talking about it because when the Fed initially started talking about transitory inflation, the idea was that transitory meant temporary, not the prices. The Fed has now admitted that the price increases that we are experiencing, they're not transitory. They're here to stay. Those increases are permanent. All the Fed is saying is that after these permanent increases go into effect, future inflation will go back to the 2% level that we had before. So that means that the increase in the cost of living is not transitory, it's permanent. And the hope is by the Fed that after we get a big increase in our cost of living, the cost of living will continue to go up from that elevated level, but at the same rate that it was before we had this transitory period of high inflation, which to me completely destroys 
any credibility that the Fed has in claiming that they've successfully contained inflation at 2%. Workers were getting in the economy were being undermined by inflation, that prices were rising faster than wages. And so everybody is actually going backwards. They're swimming against the tide here because the Fed is abiding this higher inflation and not doing anything about it. And it's not that the Fed is abiding by the higher inflation. Like it's just sitting there like an innocent bystander and just not acting to try to fight inflation. The Fed is actively creating the inflation, right? It's not just a neutral party. Its policies are inflationary. Holding interest rates at zero, quantitative easing is simply another word, a euphemism for debt monetization, which is inflation. So buy a pair and a spare for a friend. That's buyraycon.com slash gold. You know, ironically, a lot of people are pointing to the infrastructure bill that was just passed by the Senate, $1.2 trillion infrastructure package. And they're also looking at the $3.5 trillion spending bill that the Senate has now voted to take up, right? Both of these bills. And I'll talk about that one a bit more in a minute or so. But people are looking at this massive increase in fiscal stimulus. And they're actually saying, okay, this takes the pressure off the Fed to provide monetary stimulus, that they were the only game in town, that it was incumbent on the Fed to stimulate the economy with monetary policy because, you know, we weren't getting any fiscal stimulus from Congress, which, of course, is nonsense in and of itself because we've been getting massive. The answer is from the Fed. So while everybody is selling gold because they expect the Fed to taper its asset purchases, the real threat is that the Fed expands its asset purchases. Even if it tapers them a bit first, ultimately they're going way up. Just like the Fed started to shrink its balance sheet when it was four and a half trillion and it got down below four trillion, yet now we're above eight trillion. So even if the Fed manages to begin the taper process, it's never going to end it. And ultimately it's going to ramp up the size of the program because it is the only way to fund this spending, which, you know, I want to get to the magnitude of these bills. I mean, first of all, there's a lot of Republicans who signed on to the infrastructure bill. But one of the most ridiculous ways that the Senate hopes to pay for this uh, $1.2 trillion program is they're penciling in $28 billion in extra tax revenue from cryptocurrency traders or hodlers or whoever, because in the Senate bill is a reporting requirement that is actually potentially very onerous for a lot of the companies that are now operating in the crypto space. But there is going to be a lot more reporting of transactions in cryptocurrency, not just the buying and selling, but when crypto is moving around, there's going to be a lot more reports that are going to be filed with the IRS regarding the beneficial owners of the cryptocurrency so that the IRS can keep better tabs. And it's amazing that, you know, the cryptocurrencies and some of these crypto stocks, you know, they, they just shrug it off, right? They're going up anyway, even though you have something that is certainly bad news. Now, of course, they maybe think they can get this extracted from the bill before it's ultimately passed. I don't know. It seems like the odds are slim, but I'm sure they're going to try. But the point is, this is a big package that is going to be paid for by inflation. The Fed is going to print the money to do this, and that is going to continue to put more upward pressure on prices. But the bigger problem is what's queued up. This three and a half, and in fact, they're already talking about pairing the tax hikes on the rich with tax cuts for everybody else. They're not just content not to raise taxes on people who make less than 400000 They actually want to cut them. Now, of course, they're raising the inflation tax, but that's a secret, you know, stealth tax. So nobody wants to acknowledge the existence of that tax, but they all want to take credit for some type of tax cut that they want to bake into this cake. And so who knows what the net 
effect on taxes is going to be if they're cutting taxes for the 99%, yet only raising taxes for the 1%. You know, Elizabeth Warren, one of the other ways she wants to squeeze more blood out of the rich is she wants to empower the IRS to do more audits because in her words, she wants to catch all the rich tax cheats. And she thinks there's a lot of extra money there. And you're going to see it in the elevated inflation rate. But one of the reasons too, that the economy is so screwed up is because the Fed has kept interest rates so low for so long and inflated such a massive bubble. That is the other reason that we have such a big problem on the supply front. And this is not something that is going to be solved quickly for those who think that the problem with supply shortages is somehow going to be corrected. It's impossible because the economy doesn't have the productive capacity to do it. We're already seeing that in the trade deficits. But if you look at the effects Fed policy has had on allocation of resources throughout the U.S. economy, we have sent all of our money to the wrong places. We are not investing in plant equipment. You know, what nonsense. No one's going to buy popcorn with Bitcoin. And even if they could, it would increase the price of the popcorn too much. What is AMC trying to do? They're trying to get the Bitcoiners and other crypto guys to start buying AMC because now it's a crypto play. In fact, people are already talking about uh, AMC adding Bitcoin to its balance sheet with the money it got by selling its overpriced stock. But the problem is none of this money is adding to our productive capacity. They're not making any products. They're not producing all the stuff that we're importing. I mean, if you look at these massive trade deficits, it's clear what we need more of in this economy. But we're not getting that thanks to the Fed. So not only does the Fed create inflation, but it massively screws up the economy with malinvestment and it allows the U.S. government to get bigger and bigger. We would not even be discussing the infrastructure package, let alone this three and a half trillion dollar spending bill, if it wasn't for the Fed's willingness to fund the whole thing. They're borrowing, and so they don't have the money to lend to the U.S. government. Meanwhile, U.S. institutions, the bigger money, they don't want any part of U.S. treasuries. Why? Why would they want to settle for a 1% or 2% yield when they're buying these stocks that are going up at the rate they are? There's no real demand in the investment world for these low-yielding treasuries, apart from some hedge funds that have some levered strategies Real investment money has no interest in these low yields because they're just not high enough to provide any type of satisfactory return. So even people that should be buying bonds can't afford to buy bonds, and so they're gambling in the stock market. And finally, I want to talk about what's been going on with the price of gold. I think about $100 in uh, Australia trading, and that was a big move down. Um, We didn't close on the lows. We paired most of the losses. I think by the time we got into the U.S. market, gold was down about $25. But that spooked a lot of people seeing such a big move. I think it all had to do with technicals because remember when Australia opened up, it was basically almost a $40, $50 gap lower from the decline on Friday based on the better than expected non-far payroll number. But again, all of this was happening as the price of Bitcoin was rising. And as I'm recording this podcast, Bitcoin is back above 46,000. And so gold's weakness in the face of Bitcoin strength, again, is causing a lot of people to jump to the erroneous conclusion that it's Bitcoin's strength that is responsible for gold's weakness, that Bitcoin is stealing gold's thunder, that Bitcoin is siphoning it away demand that otherwise would go to gold. And here we have all this inflation. And the reason that gold is not rising is because we now have a superior alternative in Bitcoin. And as I said, the reason that gold is not rising is because people are not worried about inflation because they're confident the Fed's going to fight it and they don't want to fight the Fed. It is a speculative asset that simply moves based on its own speculators who are buying it for reasons that actually have absolutely nothing to do 
with inflation or what the Fed is going to do. That may be part of the marketing hype surrounding Bitcoin, but it's not part of the trading reality. But what I do believe is happening is it's not that Bitcoin's strength is why gold is weak and they don't want to gamble on Bitcoin. They would rather just play in the casino that is the stock market. And so that's where they are. But I do think that whatever demand has been siphoned away from gold to Bitcoin is making a much bigger difference in Bitcoin because Bitcoin has a much smaller market cap and an even smaller float. Because remember, most of the Bitcoin doesn't trade. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. If Bitcoin is living now by the weakness in gold, it will die by its strength. And gold is going to come back once investors recognize the threat that they're oblivious to once they appreciate the box that the Fed has backed us into, once they understand that more fiscal stimulus means more, not less monetary stimulus. So my advice is don't wait for the big money to figure it out. We already know, but they don't even know they don't know. And so what we want to do is get to where they're going before they even realize that they're headed there.